labor activist and activist in the Green Party. And he's running um, for the governor of the state of New York. And then we have Gloria Matera, who is the co-chair of the Green Party um, here in New York. Uh, so first we're going to have uh, Gail Parkland go. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to go first here. I will have to leave at 5 o'clock to go catch a plane back to California. But I'm delighted to be here and have an opportunity to uh, share some thoughts with you. So um, again, my name is Gail McLaughlin, and I'm the former two-term mayor of Richmond, Sorry. California. Now, Richmond is a city across the bay from San Francisco. A very diverse city um, and I'm also a co-founder as was said of the Richmond Progressive Alliance which is very important I'll share a little bit about that with you um, I'm also a candidate for lieutenant governor of California and I'll shoot all this all these things overlap and I'll, and I'll tell you a little bit about why um, so I served 13 years as a corporate free elected official in Richmond I ran, ran and won four campaigns, two for mayor, two for council, um, and won them all without a penny of corporate money. And this is in spite of this big oil refinery, a Chevron oil refinery in our city that spent millions to try and defeat me and other progressives running for office. Um, I was the first corporate free council member in Richmond, but by far not the last. Um, right now, as it is going back to November 2016, we have um, five corporate free council members sitting on the city council out of seven total. So these five council members are members of the Richmond Progressive Alliance. So that's a super majority of council members that we hold on the council. And this is in a city that just a little over a decade ago had the whole council purchased by Chevron. Chevron funded all the campaigns. Uh, the whole council was um, totally under their thumb. But things have changed. And it took us a little over a decade, but we, we made an amazing transformation of our city. I mean, we, um, we did this, uh, like I said, in spite of Chevron's trying to hold us back. And let me give you an example. In 2014, Chevron spent three and a half million dollars to try and defeat us. Um, I was running and a couple other RPA members and we all won, all the progressives won and all the Chevron candidates lost. So that goes to show you it can be done. You know, you can transform a city council, you can beat the big money. You know, we did it by reaching out to the community and over time and uh, they got to know who we were as a progressive alliance and of course when I was mayor, I had the opportunity to really engage the community in a, in a major way. Um, but why do we do this? Why do we want to transform a city council? Well, it's because we want to change the quality of life for our residents, right? Um, because in the past, Richmond was known as a high crime city, lots of poverty, things only getting worse. But what we were able to do is turn a downward spiral upward. So Sorry. now we're spiraling Sorry. upward. And the kind of quality of life changes we made, we, um, we increased the minimum wage to $15 an hour. We passed the first new rent control law in California in 30 years. We reduced crime dramatically, a 75% reduction in homicides over the eight years I was mayor. And we did this by addressing the root causes of crime, by giving opportunities to our, to our youth in particular. Um, we also stood for immigrant rights. We're a sanctuary city. We sued the Trump administration in early 2017 because of its policies against sanctuary cities. Um, we stood for our public schools against privatization. Um, we got over $100 million in additional city taxes from Chevron. Um, and that's, again, the community pressure. Uh, we also became a part of, the co of a community choice energy program, which um, gave our residents cleaner and greener and less expensive electricity. We, and we also limited Chevron's pollution. 
So, so much more. And if you want to check out more, you can go to my website, gaelforcalifornia.org, G-A-Y-L-E-F-O-R, california.org. So, how are we able to do this? How are we able to make such a massive transformation and, and really reverse this downward spiral? Well, we were able to do it because we advanced independent political power. And that's the theme of this panel. Um, and we did it by building the Richmond Progressive Alliance, the RPA. Uh, we came together in 2003, uh, regardless of party preference. Some of us were Green Party members, some of us were, some were Progressive Democrats, some were Peace and Freedom Party members, which is a party in California. Others had no party affiliation. And uh, we came together to build a local movement and to run candidates for local office without any corporate money. So that is what is behind it all, and we just kept building our movement. Now let me share with you what I've been doing over the last year and a half. So I became part of the RPA outreach team because people wanted to know how we did it in Richmond. So I've been going around California, this was starting early in 2017, and talking about, um, you know, you too can build a progressive alliance based on the, uh, the RPA model and transform your city council. So we started doing this, and at a certain point we decided if, if we ran a statewide campaign, we would be able to propel our message further along, because a candidate has a more of a stage, you know, you know louder megaphone to, um, to present the message. So I decided to run. Uh, for Lieutenant Governor, and we launched a, as an NPP, no party preference candidate, as an independent. And um, we launched the campaign as an organizing campaign. So that's the thrust of this campaign. It's to organize progressives in California. And now there is a very real possibility of a victory on June 5th. It's just a few days from now. And that's why I'm flying back to California to do the get out the vote uh, last few days here. We have an open primary in California, so the top two vote getters will go on to November. So we're hoping, we're working hard. It all depends on whether progressives are gonna show up um, to the polls on, um, on June 5th. So what are some of the successes we had in this organizing campaign over the last year? Well, we rallied progressive forces up and down the state. We worked with and were endorsed by um, the National Our Revolution Group, Bernie Sanders Our Revolution Group, and 38 Our Revolution chapters up and down California. We've been doing this since last June. Um, we also were endorsed by National Democratic Socialists of America and a dozen local chapters. We were endorsed by the California Green Party. I used to be a Green, still hold those Green values in my heart. Um, and uh, many local Green Party chapters in California. Uh, we're also endorsed by the Peace and Freedom Party, Socialist Alternative, the Movement for a Peace of People's Party, Ralph Nader, Bill McKibben. We have just a host of um, really prominent progressives and progressive groups. Um, so we sh in addition to all this, we shared the RPA model. And we shared this with hundreds of groups, thousands of individuals, and at least a dozen new progressive alliances have emerged in California since we've been encouraging this effort uh, following the RPA model. Um, and we reached out and educated millions of voters with social media, texting, phone banking, and email. And in addition to that, we've embraced corporate free candidates up and down California. We're, we've coined the term corporate free in California. It started with the Richmond Progressive Alliance. That means you run without corporate money. So there's about 30 plus candidates that um, you know, I'm endorsing, and we call it, someone dubbed it, the Gale Force. So we're, we all got a lot of force, and we're moving forward. So we're building this big progressive tent, um, you know, the really bringing people together, regardless of party preference, just like we did at a local level. There are some people, you know, a lot of people in the Our Revolution group are progressive Democrats. They um, you know, they're fighting the good fight in the Democratic Party. We don't discourage that, even though we always make it clear that uh, some of us, myself included, 
um, are committed to organizing outside the two-party system because we believe the Democratic Party is so entrenched with corporate power and we can't wait for this prolonged struggle within the Democratic Party to be resolved. So um, in terms of the bigger picture of where do we go from here, do we build another party, do we, do we uh, you know, have multiple parties, um, I, I want to just touch on that a little because political parties and candidates are really needed to participate in the electoral uh, process, but uh, and most of us think that by participating in the electoral process, we can change and improve our lives. But that's only partially true. Um, it's only true if political parties and candidates are, are about um, building working people's power. And um, I think most of us know that the election process is, lit, is rigged. Um, it allows elected officials to be brought off and to create a pseudo-democracy. I mean, some of these corporate elected officials make minor changes in policy, but they keep the system going. Um, but elections, political parties, and candidates are important. So even though we have this sort of system, you know, it, it's still important to run and win when we can um, to accumulate more power for working people and to put a people's agenda on the table. It gives us opportunities to develop, to develop organization and power and to take power away from the 1% uh, oligarchs that rule. So what is the way out of this whole mess, you know, I mean, the, the bigger way out of it? Well, it's to elect candidates who play by a different set of rules. And um, these set of rules uh, uh, mandate that candidates run um, to help build a movement with real power and build the consciousness to challenge corporate do domination. So that means building alternative um, organizations, or an alternative movement, alternative parties. Um, and these parties and organizations cannot be dependent on corporate power that rules in government. Candidates have to be committed to building people power and to see their job as building a movement outside of people power. Um, candidates should not go into office thinking, oh, well, they're gonna work with other elected officials. No, their, their purpose is to build a movement if we're really going to have independent power. So um, also candidates need to understand that we're in the, um, we have a class divide in this country and they have to know what side they're on. Um, and that would be the side of working people. Um, so ultimately, we have to build this movement that builds power to force government to respond. So I'll just end with this. Ultimately, we need to build power, organization, and unity during election years to keep building power, um, organization, and unity in non-election years, whether elected or not. I mean, ideally, be elected and keep this work going. Um, but you never stop building the movement until we are so powerful, so organized, and so unified that we are able to do what's needed to be done for all of us to improve our lives and uh, build a better society. So I'll end with that. Thank you very much. So we came to the Left Forum last night at the plenary. How many were there? And what happened? Jane Sanders invited us to enroll in the Democratic Party to vote for primary. At the Left Forum. You know, we had panels like this in 2016. On the other hand, Chris Hedges called for the destruction of the Democratic Party yesterday. That wasn't the plenary. No, not the plenary. Uh, yeah, you can find all kinds of things at the left forum, but I'm just, I think this symptomatic of where uh, things are at right here. I was just talking 
Was it uh, Rick Wolf that called me? Yeah. Labor, he was here for a labor conference? No, it was Mark Laus, who was a historian from uh, Cincinnati. He said he got the same thing at a you know labor studies uh, conference. Um, here in New York, we have a quote unquote left, if you listen to the media, that is the progressive Democrats, who well, here in New York City are the party of the landlords. I'm not even sure they're a capitalist party anymore. They're not exploiting labor, they're jacking up the rent and pushing the working class out of the city. You know, in 2016, we had panels like this and this room was full. And now in the era of Trump, uh, where I think we're, we've shrunk. Independent, people talk about independent politics has shrunk. The blue wave is, is uh, putting everybody in the Democratic Party to stop Trump. And as I'll say in a, in a minute, they're uh, really on the same team. Democrats and Republicans at the leadership level. I'm not talking about grassroots voters. Uh, if we're going to unite, we've got to unite around some principles. And I, I would argue that that's class independence around a left party that is clear that it's not in with the capitalist parties. Uh, we lost the left in this country when, under the policy of the Popular Front, the Communist led in the 30s and the labor movement, they all went into the Democratic Party with the New Deal. And the left as a significant force in American politics disappeared, hasn't got out of there. There's some of us who've been out, but we're relatively on the margins. Even though the first working class party in the world was formed right here in this city and elected in its first election, the president of the Carpenter Union to the state assembly, that was a working class party of 1829. Its leader, Thomas Sedgwick, uh, would feel right comfortable in the intersectionality of today's politics. He was for not only freeing the slaves, but making sure they had land and capital as reparations for the unpaid labor so they could start, have a fresh start. Indian nations should be part of the United States, the Cherokee Nation, for example. Women should have the right to vote. He was even worried that capitalistic enterprise, which was expanding without any limit, would destroy the environment. And this cap was way ahead of its time. But uh, here we are, what? 150 years later, and we're still, still talking about how to do what those working people did in 1829. And they, they right away saw that the problem was capitalism. They were artisans and farmers who were independent producers. That was the basis of Republican liberty in the early period of democracy in this country. And they found out they'd lost their independence because they were dependent on a boss who now had the tools. So they said large scale production should be cooperative socialized so we get the full fruit of our labor and we manage our own labor. Um, so these answers have been around a long time. And this was when Karl Marx was 11 years old, running around sure, I don't know what he was doing as 11 year old, but he wasn't writing the Communist Manifesto yet. So here we are 150 years later, and we're not even clear on independent politics. Um, and I would say without that party, with it, identity as an alternative, you know, this progressive politics inside the Democratic Party, you get lost in the sauce. Your vote is for a Democrat. They don't know what that vote is for. Whereas we got 5% running against Cuomo four years ago, and Cuomo wants to run for president, he wants to get more votes than his daddy, and he didn't. And so we had to say, well, why didn't they get those votes? What were those Greens talking about? And even what Zephyr Teacher was talking about in the primary, because she picked up some of our A ban on fracking, $15 minimum wage, tuition-free, higher education. I mean, there are 19 issues we've got where Cuomo has moved our way when he was on the other side, even though he walks the walk more than he talks, I mean, talks the talk when he walks the walk. So tuition-free higher education is only for some middle-class folks who can actually afford to take that scholarship. Um, you know, lower-income people really can't afford to use it because they got to do living expenses and, the, and I mean, they got to work, and that means they can't graduate in time to keep the scholarship. So um, that's just to say, uh, we have good reforms, but watch out when the Democrats say, oh, we'll do that. Um, so a couple things Gail raised, I, I want to give a different perspective. Um, the Richmond model, which is nonpartisan, multi-party, people get any party, but the elections there are not partisan. You go to the next level, that coalition breaks up. I mean, I happened to be, Gail was out campaigning, but I happened to be when she got the formal nomination at the Richmond Press Alliance meeting. I have a brother in Oakland, so... I went over there and they nominated uh, Giovanna Beckles, council member for state assembly as a Democrat. 
And I was surprised. There was no debate about the Democratic Party. It's just we're going to endorse our people for these offices. Um, and, you know, I had raised, I don't know if Gail ever saw this discussion. It was on the solidarity list with Mike Parker's on it. He's a key person organizing there. And I said, you know, you guys haven't taken on George Miller, who was a, was a very liberal member of Congress, co-founder of the Progressive Caucus. But, you know, like a Democrat, he would do sometimes what the business interests want. Like he was the Democratic sponsor of No Child Left Behind. And uh, then something that affected me personally, he was the guy that put the amendments in Omnibus Spending Bill 2015 that changed ERISA, the Employment Retirement Income Security Act, which had protected our earned pension benefits and said you can cut them in multi-employer pension funds. So I retired earlier this year and my pension was cut by the Treasury Department approval Cut, the cut was approved by the Treasury Department of 20%. And, uh, you know, thank you, George Miller. The, the, the thing was, and I raised this with Mike, is um, you guys were not in a position as a unit to go against Miller. And Mike was saying, well, we weren't able to. But I would argue back that you get 5% against Miller, you, you get his attention, you can influence what he does, and you ignore him because your coalition, because his multi party can't really. Take, take him on as an independent party at that level, he's got a free ride, and the Democrats got a free ride. And even the most progressive of them put a progressive face on what's fundamentally a reactionary party. Um, on the question of corporate free, yes, you can run without corporate money and even get elected. And I, before I make this criticism, I want to say that I just ran for mayor and deal with my model. I kept talking about Richmond, California, particularly the police department, which in Syracuse is sucking the city dry. I mean, he's, I won't use the words that the cops don't like to say, but they work three or four years on patrol, then they do desk jobs. They screw them up, they screw up the books, they screw up the records. They sit there doing overtime like um, they uh, were, were doing background checks on Pop Warner volunteers on overtime so they could get more overtime. Nobody asked them to do that. And uh, so they're taking 45% of the city budget. Our crime and murder rates, uh, we were a six third or sixth worst murder rate. We, we went way past Richmond, which used to be in that category. So what they did there uh, was a model, and um, Gail outlined some of them, and I can't think of another mayorality, that's the right word, mayorship, uh, that got more done than Gail did as the mayor of Richmond. But that said, um, you can run corporate free and get in office, but you're still not really corporate free because the system is still there. Think of Dennis Kucinich when he was mayor of Cleveland in the 70s. And the bankers and the utility wanted to privatize their municipal power utility. And Kucinich said no. And the bankers said, oh yeah? And they called him the boy mayor. They said, boy, you're not gonna be mayor anymore. We're not gonna roll over your line of credit, which every city needs because revenues fluctuate and you need cash to make payroll, etc." And so they forced the city into bankruptcy. And Kucinich into the wilderness for 20 years. 20 years later, they found out because the interest rates jacked up so much, the Republican they got in there couldn't actually privatize the utility because it just didn't make economic sense anymore in that high inflation period there in the late 70s. And then they looked back 20 years later and found out Kucinich had saved them hundreds of millions of dollars in utility fees. And he kind of was rehabbed and he was able to go back into politics. But the point is, you can be in office, but you're not corporate free because that structure's there. So that's another reason to have a party that's against the system and against the two parties that maintain the system. Because it's a two-party system of corporate rule. And, and what I want to do in the last part here is, is give you some examples of that. Because I, I think it doesn't hit home. You know, the mayor of New York is called a progressive. And he got elected by jumping the progressive lane after John Lewis was doing well and he got into trouble with campaign financing. De Blasio jumped over there and the tail of two cities. But as Gloria could tell you from personal experience, she ran against him twice for city council, Mayor de blah blah, because he talks. But who he really represents is the landlords. I experienced this this week. I was uh, fasting in solidarity with the uh, tenants of 85 Bowery, who the city, on behalf of a greedy landlord, threw out of their apartment in the middle of the night in January, threw their belongings into dumpsters. They had the dumpster dive to get back medicines and their belongings, family pictures. And they went on a five-day hunger strike in February in the cold out there in front of uh, their, their apartment building. 
and they got the mayor to say, oh, okay, we'll monitor it. Nothing happened. They're still not in there, so they did another hunger strike this week. So the Glasgow says, oh, oh, go up to the Bronx with all your paperwork and we'll put you in the front of line for public housing. And these are Chinese immigrants. They're much more together, you know, as a group than Americans who can be picked off one by one for two avenues. And uh, they said, no, we have rent stabilized apartments. We're not going to get kicked out so this guy can set up luxury apartments there. And uh, by the third day of the hunger strike, the landlord said, okay, okay, this is too much bad publicity for me. I'm going to let you back in, even though the Glasgow's still trying to get into public housing. So what did they do? They said, uh, not thank you, kind sir. We'll go be quiet now and go back to our apartments when we can get in at the end of the summer. They said, now we want to do community rezoning because the Glasgow's plan is the plan to gentrify the whole neighborhood. And we may have saved our one apartment, but the whole thing's going to be luxury apartments. And uh, you know how that goes here in New York City, those of you who are in New York. I mean, half of them are empty. They're just laundering money for drug dealers and Russian oligarchs and, you know, Saudis and whatnot. So that's, that's what the progressives in the city represent, progressive Democrats. And then go upstate, and I'll talk a little bit about the guy I'm running against, Governor Cuomo, whose uh, brother from another mother, Joe Percoco, his right-hand man, has been convicted of soliciting bribes on behalf of uh, a man who just pleaded guilty to bribing Percoco, uh, Peter Galbraith Kelly Jr. And him and his daddy, Sr., uh, have both been uh, national treasurers of the Democratic National uh, Committee. Peter Galbraith Jr. is also the treasurer for the Democratic branch of the National Endowment for Democracy, which meddles in other countries' politics. And uh, so he brought Prococo to smooth the way for this power plant, this frack gas power plant that will add 10% uh, more greenhouse gases out of New York State. And they don't need the power to replace any endpoint, they'll just replace other power plants that already can replace any endpoint. And so that's sleazy enough, but the fact is these people are in bed with the Trumpists. Uh, Peter Galbraith Kelly Sr. was in the uh, public relations and lobbying firm of Black, Manafort, Stone, and Kelly. That is Charlie Black, Paul Manafort, Roger Stone, Lee Atwater was a principal, and Peter Kelly, the Democrat, who was the treasurer of the National Democratic Committee. Their clients were people like Jesse Helms, you know, probably the most racist senator we've had in, in you know, the last 50 years. Charlie Black, one of those partners, cut his teeth on Jesse Helms. Uh, campaign in 72, they got him elected the first time. There are clients for people like Mobutu from Zaire and Marcos from the Philippines. And, you know, all these dictators and corporations and dirty, you know, right-wing politicians. And, you know, this is a top dog in the Democratic Party, treasurer of the Democratic Party, doing business with these guys. And then the son, Peter Kelly Jr., is still with Charlie Black from that same firm, doing the same kind of business, representing those kind of clients. That's the Democratic Party. And I don't think the left has any business organizing anybody near the Democratic Party. Otherwise, like I said, if you get lost in the sauce, the left doesn't have its own voice. And when we do have our own voice, and you know, I think Richmond, the Richmond Progressive Alliance at that level was an independent voice. They beat Chevron. I mean, that shows we can do this. I think the 5% we got four years ago gave us some leverage to get some reforms. So what we're doing this year, our slogan is demand more. We demand more in the, in the sense of, like Ralph Nader says, let's raise our expectations. We can't have crooks running the government. And we got it from top to bottom. Demand more, we can win more reforms. And then, but we want more than piecemeal reforms. Demand more also means we got to change the system. Thanks. Chair of the Green Party of New York, and I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Green Party in the United States. Um, I've been a candidate before. Um, I'm really thrilled to be both with Gail and Howie, who are candidates and elected representatives I admire. Uh, and I am also 
a socialist and been involved both in organized socialist um, groups and as an independent socialist. Uh, how we refer to being in this room in 2016 where Jill Stein and our presidential candidate um, and others were on a panel in the room was, was standing room only and obviously there was a lot of conversation um, around Sanders, uh, Stein, the Green Party, uh, you know, those, that kind of dialogue, people were really interested in having that debate. But also in 2017, we were in this room and it was also standing room only. And I think people were here then to have a conversation about left unity. Um, and a lot of disappointment for some people around what was both done to Sanders and what Sanders had done um, when it came down to the Democratic, um, when it came down to you know the Democratic uh, presidential candidate uh, and that campaign, and what you know what kind of came after that, and so what was interesting about that time, uh, besides being a lot more people in the room, is there are still people who felt like we were going to continue to carry this banner of if only Bernie would, um, and what I want to say is that that's one of our distractions when we're trying to build an independent um, left party and when we're talking about unity. Because it's people waiting around for one particular person who became an icon for something to do something that we want him to do or that some people wanted him to do. Um, and he wasn't particularly interested in that. Now some of the formations and some of the activism and some of the activation of people that came out of the campaign in 2016 um, really changed a lot of things and infused a different conversation. Um, that's a conversation I think we need to continue um, and I hope we're going to improve on and going here. And so one of the questions I guess that came up in the description, what, what Callie and Gail are talking about, like, so does party affiliation matter? Is that really important? Well, it's important to me for, for Lots of reasons, but kind of different perspective. First of all, the Democrats and the Republicans control how elections are run. They do that nationally, and the whole issues around debates and who can be in the debates and who can have money and who gets on TV. But they also do it state by state because every state has different laws and they control those laws. In New York, they, the Democrats and Republicans, control. And what Bruce Dixon, our comrade in the Green Party, said in an earlier session. They legislate us away. That's what they use, and they use that in different states in different ways. When you can run in a nonpartisan race, that's a little bit different. Greens do pretty well um, for that. But party affiliation matters because you know there are two corporate parties, and their affiliation and their brand is very strong. So when we're told, let's all just be one big group and party affiliations don't matter. And why not dissolve those parties too? I completely support the idea on local level that independents or socialists or green candidates can kind of band together. I really um, acknowledge the you know non-corporate stance of Richmond Progressive Alliance and what I appreciate Gail saying in terms of continuing to build a movement uh, and to organize people. And one of my, I think the best thing she said for me today, which is always something I say when I ran for office, which is like, no, the, your job when you get elected is not to figure out how I'm gonna compromise or how I'm gonna work with the other people. And, and then you actually get asked that question to debate. You're the only, if you get elected, you'll be the only Green. Will you work with the Democrats? Hell no, I won't work with the Democrats. I'm working for the people that elected me to go there and work for that. And I really appreciate um, that that was something really important um, that Richmond Progressive Alliance said. But, you know, until there's some change and some shaking up of the two-party system and the laws that control that and the money that controls that, to me, party affiliation matters. Because my party is believes in election integrity and will stand up and challenge elections and recount elections and go and review those numbers and go to court when we can, when we think and we know that there has been um, tampering with elections going on. And when the Democrats won't even do that to get their own candidate to win, or when their own candidate did win, like Al Gore. 
They could have changed that election and they chose not to because that upsets capital. And that is what's more important than to pretend it's a democracy here. Uh, my party affiliation matters because we stand up for Palestinian rights as a party, not an individual candidate in there. As a party, we are on record and every candidate that runs for office needs to believe in that like all our other parts of the program. And my party affiliation matters because we understand that capitalism is both destroying our lives as humans and the environment. And so we talk more about eco-socialism and how we need to look at those two things uh, as integrated and how we have to look at a way to change society where the capital is not what's governing everything that happens both to us as human beings and to the earth. Now, is it a challenge? Yes, it's a big challenge. Um, and even to talk about becoming, uh, you know, a, an independent left party uh, is a long way to go. Um, I think that doing that on the local level is very helpful. Um, I think that's kind of the way to do it. I think the fact that we are, though, a national party, the Green Party, and that we are connected internationally to parties does mean something. And I just go, well, I guess I want to say a little bit about this still thing about party affiliation a little bit more, I'm kind of stuck on that. But so our revolution, I guess it's one of the one of the numerous organizations that kind of grew out of the Sanders presidential campaign. I don't know, does party affiliation matter to them? It does when Green Party candidates have come to them and asked to be endorsed. Um, that's happened, I know one in New York, I don't know how many others, but most of the other people endorse the Democrats. So if you look at party affiliation very narrowly, like I'm a big part of the Democratic Party, maybe, maybe people are different. Progressive Democrats on the ground are different. Candidates have a lots of different ways of presenting themselves as progressive. Um, I'm not gonna say there are no progressive Democrats that support some of the things that the Green Party does, but when you stay in that party and that's your affiliation, then you know, it's kind of a pox on your house too. Like, Greens get that. I feel like it's the same thing for Democrats. Um, and just to kind of um, wrap up a little, because I know Gail has to go, and so it would really be nice for her to be able to, uh, she has to say anything else or take some questions. I don't know how you're arranging the um, time here, because I can always come back and, and, and say more, is that um, we have a lot of work to do to stay relevant and visible. And sometimes people say to me like, well, maybe it's the Green Party name or the Green Party brand. Well, is it because we're um, couched as environmentalists only? Is that such a bad thing to be? Of course we're not. Um, what else is the Green Party brand? Oh, it's the party of Ralph Nader, the spoiler party. That's another brand that we have to you know, kind of talk about and kind of argue against and show that we're different. And so I think if you look at our party platform and the integrity of our candidates and what we've done in terms of um, election integrity and standing up for unpopular causes uh, around the world, then that brand feels good to me. Uh, do I think we have a lot of work to do uh, and that we need to look at the Green Party and look at our kind of like-minded, um, independent political candidates out there um, and people who are affiliated with the party kind of in a looser way, yes, I think we do. But I think that at this point, in talking about building left unity, the Green Party has a really important place. Whether that be left independent party in the future, which I hope as I get closer to Social Security collection happens before, um, and while I'm still around, that maybe we won't be called the Green Party but the Green Party will be a key player and a key component of that left independent political party that I hope we will be building soon. Thank you. So I, I just want to thank everybody and, and thank you Gloria and Holly for your great um, presentations. Um, I just want to clarify, in California, our statewide races are not um, partisan. So, you know, it's the top two vote getters, regardless of party. So yes, you do register as a, yeah, I register as an independent, but 
uh, others, registered as Democrat or Republican, but it could be two Democrats who win, two NPPs, no party preference, two Republicans, it could be anything. So you really, you don't run party primaries. It's, it's different. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, in terms of, um, in terms of, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, but in, in terms of where we're at now, for me, it's very important that, that we do come together based on our values. Um, that, that mass party of the future, whatever it is, is something we have to consider, but it's gonna take a lot of brainstorming. Um, and right now, for me, it's just keeping our heads above water and trying to come together as best we can regardless of party affiliation, and yes, hold on to your parties. I encourage the Green Party uh, to keep doing the good work it's doing. Um, and in terms of those progressive Democrats who really feel they're fighting a good fight, um, I think we have to stay connected with their values and let them know that um, we support their values, even as we separate ourselves as independents. And, um, so